maybe I'll start off with the at the very beginning um, and ask both of you to maybe talk about this term mass incarceration and at what point the term mass incarceration became the stated policy of the United States. Well, I'll start. Um, you know, the term has never become stated policy. Um, we only came to call mass incarceration after it was clear that it was a fact. By mass incarceration, we mean that the United States has become the world leader in its use of imprisonment. We lock up a greater proportion of our citizens and any other nation on Earth. And it really strikes me as fundamentally uh, very disturbing that the wealthy society in the world decided to pride itself on democratic traditions, also somehow incarcerates its citizens at the world leader position. Um, when mass incarceration began back in the early 1970s, no one ever said our goal is to develop this massive prison system as a strategy to deal with crime. It was, you know, one policy here and another policy there. Uh, and then it became called the war on crime, the war on drugs, and all that. And before we knew it 30 years later, um, that's what we had, mass incarceration. Yeah, I think that's, you know, exactly right. I mean, there have been uh, moments where people have affirmatively made the case, listen, we need to have more people locked up in this country. And I think it's important to to, to note that, even though nobody's ever said we, you know, mass incarceration is going to be national policy, um, I was recently looking at, it, and I would encourage folks you can you can Google and find it. But uh, the Attorney General in 1992, William Barr, uh, signed a working paper, and it's called the title of it is "The Case for More Incarceration." And you know, today as we sit here, and it seems like. You know, everybody agrees that mass incarceration is a problem. It's worth stepping back and being clear that there were people that were making the argument that we needed to lock up many more people in this country. Um, the other thing, though, I do agree with Mark, that when you actually try to figure out how did this come about, it's really about a series of small steps made by discrete actors often unrelated to one another, and in some instances not like this, people not understanding the consequences of what they were going to do. So I mean, if you think about our, our criminal justice system, it's not really a system, right? We have police, we have prosecutors, we have judges, we have juries, we have parole and probation officers, we have court social workers, and none of those people answer to the same individual. So really what's happened, I think, over the last 40 years is in every milk and cranny of the country, faced with a combination of fear, um, some of it racialized, some of it real, people responded over 40 years in every corner by getting tougher, by getting harsher, by getting more punitive, by isolating more people. And what happens when everybody pushes in the same direction for 40 years is, you know, you can think of it as a, you know, this sort of boulder or rock that just starts moving. And now it's become this runaway freight train. Thank you for that. I'm gonna, I'm not debating with you up here at all, hopefully. Um, but I just wanted to maybe ask you to extrapolate a little bit more about some of the contributing factors to mass incarceration because I did hear you say that everybody recognizes that it's a problem, but if everyone recognized that it's a problem, then I don't think we would have 2.5 million people that are incarcerated, 8 million under some form of correctional control. And so I know that, you know, I'll let you elaborate, but I know there are capital gains to be made from mass incarceration. There are uh, folks that play hidden forces and not so hidden forces that I think um, require us talking about and shining the light on. Because I think this is the only way that if the moral majority does believe that mass incarceration is a huge problem, predominantly to communities of color, then we have to isolate the reason that it still is able to exist in 2015. No, I mean, I think, I think that's exactly right. And I think part of it is connected, I guess, in a way you can also think of it as connected to the, um, to the exhibit that you have helped to create, and or that you created, and that I hope that folks um, go and see, 
which is about solitary, solitary confinement. So right, one way I think to think about solitary confinement is almost as a, as a metaphor for our criminal justice system more broadly, right? So what we've done is we've, we isolate and we banish and we exclude. And we do that in, in prisons and we do that throughout our criminal justice system, right? So we banish people, I mean, prison itself is a form of banishment. Um, but beyond that, um, when we put people 40, 50, 100, 500, 1,000 miles from their home, and this then starts to get connected to your point about it, who's making money, right? So we are building prisons that are far away from where people who are being incarcerated live. That's creating jobs for people in those communities. Those prisoners then are no longer counted as part of, in the census, they're no longer counted as part of the communities where they're from. They become counted as part of the communities where they're incarcerated, which adds to the political and the legislative power of those communities. Then we make it, then we isolate further, be, and banish further by making it very expensive to even call even speak over the phone to your loved one who's in prison, two, three, four, five dollars a minute, there's money made there. So you're asking this question about, about institutions and incentives and um, who's making, why is there, why do there continue to be entrenched interests in defending this system, right? So you've got jobs, you've got, um, uh, you've got the phone call. You've got the political. You've got the moving, the the changing of political power, uh, and I think what has then happened is we've now created all of these institutions, from police to prosecutors to corrections unions, all of whom have an incentive in maintaining the status quo. So I agree with you. I mean, I didn't want to be um, flip when I said you know everybody understands that it's a problem now. Uh, I meant. I, my guess is most of the people in this room who have come here understand it to be a problem. But I wanted to make clear to people that at the time it was being created and still today, there are people who defend it and people who have advocated for it. Mark, do you want to add Yeah. Well, just, um, you know, I, so I, I think it operates sort of on two levels. So yes, in, in one sense, it's 50 states and thousands of jurisdictions and people making day-to-day -day decisions and the like and all that. And, and that's actually what's happened. At the same time, there was a bigger picture too, right? So we have, going back to the early 70s, we have the beginning of the growing inequality in the US, we have huge shifts in the economy, manufacturing jobs leave, particularly in inner city areas, nothing replaces them in the rural areas where prisons are now built, nothing replaces it there either. And then some of this is about problem solving. So yes, crime is a problem. That's not just an invented thing. Yes, substance abuse is a problem as well. And that's gone up and down over time. So the question is, given fundamental social problems, how do we solve those problems? How do we try to address them? And that's where I think the mass incarceration and other dynamics very much premised on race and class and resources defines what our approach is. You know, the most obvious one probably is in the mid-1980s, Congress passed a notorious crack cocaine <coughs> mandatory sentencing policy. It's very harsh penalties for crack offenders, much more so than for powder cocaine. And crack cocaine was, is a dangerous drug for many other dangerous drugs, but when crack came along, the image of the crack user and seller, whether or not it's correct, was that of a young black man or a young black woman. And that image, I think, can't be separated from the speed by which that legislation raised with Congress. There's never any discussion about what is this drug, what do we know about its impact, what do we know about treatment, what options do we have. The only issue at play was how much punishment will be imposed here. Uh, now, nobody ever said the goal is to lock up young black men through these mandatory penalties, but that's exactly what it did. Uh, so how we frame the question, I think, is very much part of mass incarceration. Yeah, I would like to also add that some of the incentives is a, another incentive would be a free labor force, essentially, because you have 
um, hundreds of thousands of human beings that are locked up and forced to work for two to 20 cents an hour, right? And so this is not something that we can ignore when you're looking at the history of a consumer capitalist society founded on the, the backs of slaves, chattel slavery, and, um, and then that running into the same economic paradigm that our prisons are presenting for us. Um, so in terms of incentives, I do think that is another one. Um, you were just talking about uh, the crack cocaine sentencing in particular. And um, one of the questions that I have here, so we understand that crack cocaine is potentially very dangerous. It can, like many drugs, destroy lives. So what is the actual rationale for reducing the penalties that go along with using crack cocaine? Well, you know, in 2010, after nearly a quarter century of agitation, Congress finally reduced the sentencing disparity between crack cocaine and powder cocaine. They didn't eliminate it, they reduced it, and you know, it, it took two decades to do that. Um, so, what, what is the rationale for reducing penalties? Well, we, I think the flip side of the question is what is the rationale for putting what's in most cases low level drug offenses in prison for mandatory terms of 5, 10, and 20 years? Um, yes, there are substance abuse problems, and what can we gain in terms of dealing with these drugs uh, through these long mandatory terms? Well, there's probably no other kind of offense where we gain so little as we do when it comes to drug offenses. And the problem is the vast majority of the people locked up for drug offenses, they're not going to prison for using drugs, they're going for selling drugs, but <clears throat> the vast majority are the street corner sellers, the mid-level sellers, they're not the so-called drug kingpins. So you arrest somebody, hit on the street corner, selling crack cocaine or some other drug or so, take him away, take him to court, he's convicted, goes up to prison. How long does it take for him to be replaced on that street corner after he's been arrested? Well, it's going to take about 20 minutes in most neighborhoods. As long as there's a demand for drugs, there's an almost endless supply of people willing to step up and try to make some money in disadvantaged communities in particular. So we put hundreds of thousands of people in prison for these fences. The impact on the drug trade, the impact on drug abuse, it's very difficult to document anything. Meanwhile, we're spending millions of dollars locking them up. This money could be spent on prevention, treatment approaches. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Louisiana today just defeated uh, a bill that would um, decriminalize medical marijuana in the state. We usually blast for everything. So that's totally expected. Um, but we have seen some successes in Colorado and Washington, and of course California, where they legalized marijuana. Do you, either of you, or both of you, think this is the beginning of the end of the drug war? Do you think it will contribute to decarceration or maybe the end of mass incarceration? Um, I think it's an encouraging first step. Um, you know, some of my Friends who work in the drug policy reform movement think, you know, mass incarceration is going to disappear. And, you know, um, there's bad news about that. It's not that simple. Um, you know, first of all, in terms of marijuana, um, marijuana is, takes up significant resources for police and arresting people and for courts and prosecuting them in some local jail time. There's not very many people in state and federal prisons, certainly for using marijuana. There are people who are selling large quantities. So, we can't imagine going to empty the prisons by legalizing marijuana. That, that, that's, there may be other reasons to, but it, it's not for that. Um, the real challenge, I think, is you know, can we have a broader strategy of you know, reconfiguring, rethinking how to approach substance abuse that relies much more on a public health approach than a criminal justice approach. And those, that shift is not easy because you know, how do you deal with more serious drugs, um, you know, cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, prescription drugs. There are much better things we could be doing, but it's going to be a lot harder to make that shift than it is with uh, medical marijuana or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely, and I want to sort of jump in on that and in a way on the last question as well. And there's a, there's a case that I had that I, it, for me, I think highlights a lot of things that Mark has been talking about, about you know, for 20, 25 years, people would respond to those of us that argued for a less punitive criminal justice system by saying things like, yeah, but is it, you know, aren't drugs a problem? And the answer, of course, is yes, drugs are a problem. The question is, what are we doing about them? So I have a case 
Um, this was in D.C. when I was a public defender uh, client who was uh, charged with selling marijuana. And she, I'm uh, sorry, selling heroin. And it was a small amount of heroin. She was a re she was a second time uh, offender, and she was an addict. And so she was selling a little bit to finance her own addiction. And she <coughs> was facing mandatory minimum. And in fact, because she had had these prior convictions, she was facing the possibility of 60 years in prison. <coughs> now, the prosecutor came to me and, with the plea offer and said, well, we'll agree not to ask for more than five years in prison. So I go with, meet with my client and I tell her, Ms. Williams, uh, I'll call her Ms. Williams, I, I go to meet with her and I say, listen, here's the plea offer. And she thinks about it for a while. And then she says, no, I want a plea offer, but I don't want that plea offer. Go get a better plea offer. And because I'm an addict, she says to me, so get me a treatment program. Now I know that she's an addict. I've, her record suggests that. I go back to the prosecutor and I say, listen, we need a better deal in five years. My client is an addict. I tell the whole story. I tell all, there's a lot of positive things to say about Ms. Williams, her relationship with her family. I tell her all of that. The prosecutor, who was a pretty decent prosecutor, she worked well with me before in some cases, looks over at the file, and she sees the prior, two prior drug programs. And she says, no, we're not gonna be able to do it. Because she's been in drug programs before, and it hasn't worked. And I almost erupted. Because first of all, she'd been in prison before too, but we never treat prison's failure as the reason not to start in prison, right? And second of all, anybody who has been an addict, who has loved an addict, who has known an addict, who has studied addiction, knows that you, many, many people, need many opportunities, multiple chances before something takes. So I tell all of this to the prosecutor. She says, listen, I'm sorry, our office has rules, and okay. So I then present the case to my well, I got to go to trial. I present the case to my colleagues, and we had no case. I mean, she had been arrested on the corner. There was an officer that had seen the whole thing. She had the mark money in her pocket. I mean, what, this is one of these cases in the public defender's offices when you go and present it, and you try to get help, everyone comes back and says, what was the plea offer again? <laughs> so, but she won't take it. So we go to trial. On the morning of, I, I, I really, on the morning of, as we're sitting out, I could tell that something's wrong with her. This has never been true before, but she was really sleepy outside of court, and I knew she was under a lot of stress. Unfortunately, sleepiness and nodding off is also a sign of heroin use, which I knew the folks in the courtroom would know. We go in, and miraculously, and this just sometimes happens in a high-volume practice, the, the police officers didn't show up that day, the case got dismissed, the, and, and I'm like running, trying to run out the courtroom, and she's like kind of walking slowly, and I'm trying not to look too, too paranoid, but I'm like, let's get out of here. <laughs> we get out in the hallway, and I had never mentioned anything about my concerns about her using, but she must have picked up on it, because as we were getting ready to leave, and she's free to go, the case was over, she says to me, Mr. Foreman, I just want you to know I, I am going to get help. And I said to her, I believe you, Ms. Williams. But here's the thing. I know that she wasn't going to get help. And not because she didn't want help. Because the only thing our criminal justice system was offering was back in the courtroom, and it was prison. That was it. That was the only thing we had to respond to this problem was prison. Now that she was not in the system, her chances of getting in a treatment program, which were almost zero beforehand, had gone down to zero. Because the only programs we had, which weren't many, were through the criminal justice system. How sick is that? That is the real story of how choosing to think of drug abuse and drug addiction and drug trafficking as a criminal problem rather than a public health problem, that's how it cashes out. And we're still doing that. There's a Ms. Williams story, if any of you are here, work in the criminal court, public defenders or otherwise, what I just described from some time ago is hap happened right today in multiple courtrooms and courthouses in this city. 
Um, one of the things that comes as a surprise to me is now that there seems to be a movement from the conservatives um, to decarcerate, to end mass incarceration, in particular Newt Gingrich and the Koch brothers are calling for an end to mass incarceration. Can Mark, can you extrapolate a little bit about how this came about, and does it give either one of you optimism? Uh, it's complicated. Um, so I first knew something was up uh, five years ago. I get a dinner invitation and said, uh, I want to bring together a small group of people to talk about the problems in prisons, why we have so many people locked up, why so many drug offenders, and see what we can do about it. And the invitation came from Newt Gingrich. Um, and my friends who are here can tell you, I'm not the sort of person who expect to get invited to dinner by Newt Gingrich very often. Um, so we only have this meeting, this dinner meeting, and there's 25 people there, um, half a dozen of us liberal types, and the other people are big name conservatives, Gingrich, Grover Norquist, uh, Michael Steele, at the time was head of the Republican National Committee, and other luminaries like that, and over the course of this three-hour dinner, we had this very free-flowing discussion. I'm not going to say we agreed on everything, but it was a surprising amount. We probably came from a somewhat different position, but ended up in some similar places, you know, particularly when it came to the drug war. Um, I think the conservatives think, you know, they sort of hate the federal government, they associate the federal government with the drug war, which is not unreasonable. Um, if you're a true conservative and you want to spend money better, then spending money on big prisons has not been very productive or anything like that. So there's been some coming together around things. Um, you know, I work in Washington, we uh, work on Capitol Hill and coalition of various kinds. So, you know, not infrequently, you know, I'm in the rooms these days with Gingrich and Bergen Lockers and the like. Um, I think. I'm not sure they're advocating anything dramatically different or things that <coughs> James and I somehow forgot to come up with in the last 30 years or so. Um, but what it does do is, I think it opens up the political space on these issues. Uh, you know, the problem is, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time doing research and policy reporting and the like, and I think it's very important, but it's not the lack of research that got us here. It's that we have a political climate that's been very hostile to any kind of criminal justice reform, and that's often as true of Democrats as it is of Republicans. So by having these new conservatives coming on board, I think it opens up the political space so that mainstream Democrats, mainstream Republicans can begin to believe they could advocate for something reasonable and not have to worry about not getting reelected, and that gives us a little bit of optimism. Yeah, I, I mean, I sh sure, like it's definitely better than not having than like not having anybody on your side. But I've got a lot of concerns about this. Number one, I don't see it. I don't see it moving anything on the ground. So I don't see changes in practices down in individual courthouses um, changing. Number two, I worry about the motivation of when your principal motivation is saving money. And I know that's not the only motivation, but it is a motivation I see driving a lot of the movement. And one of the problems is, is that we can do a lot of really bad things in the criminal justice system less expensively. So a big one is moving from prisons to probation. That's a big push. And probation is better than prisons. There's no question about that. But probation, especially probation systems that are structured to be done on the cheap and even to make money off of the people that are on probation, exploiting people through fines, fees, trapping people in a never-ending cycle of debt, which has gotten a little bit more news attention. You know, Ferguson made this really clear, but it's not just Ferguson. That problem will, if you move from prison to that, you've saved a lot of money. Um, but you have still made people's lives extremely difficult um, to unbearable. The other thing, I guess, that where, you know, you had, you had sort of said, well, what, you know, kind of what's it going to take, or why hasn't, why have we defined, why, have, why haven't we been willing to be more merciful, in, in a sense? 
um, or even to define prison as the way we deal with the problem in the first instance. And I do think part of that has to do with people's personal experiences. I mean, the criminal justice problem is almost like the flip side of the kind of the gay rights movement, right, where everybody said, well, the great thing is that, you know, it's everyone has a family member, everyone's been personally touched, but one of the most terrible things about the way the criminal justice system has been very narrowly prosecuted on the poorest people is that there aren't that many people who have means, who have a loved one in their family who has suffered from our overly punitive criminal justice system. It's not that there's nobody, there's some, but there's not that many. When it happens, you see people flipping right away. I mean, I don't know if other people, I have been fascinated by this story of the, the Duggar family the, that, you know, the, that have the I'm show 19. <laughs> no, because they were, there was an interview last night on Fox News with this family, there's this couple, there's a, the son, John, do people know about this? Or? Okay, son, yes, okay, so everyone knows. All right, so, so, but here's the thing, the, the parents are on Fox News saying, we want the system to be merciful towards our son. And we want juveniles to be treated as juveniles. And we want juvenile confidentiality to mean something. And this is on fire, and, and Megan Kelly is like, I mean, it's like nobody's ever made this argument before. She's like, you know, she's really feeling the pain of, this, of these parents. Well, I have clients that are serving long prison sentences and lifetime sexual offender registration for much less. Now, let me be clear. My argument is not that that punitiveness that I've described happening to poor people should, start, it should happen to everybody. It's the opposite. The compassion and the mercy and the capacity to understand that nobody should be defined by their worst act, those things, that the Duggars understand, I want those translated down through the rest of the Fox News network because simultaneously as they're ex expressing compassion for the Duggars, Bill O'Reilly is saying, if you do the crime, you gotta do the cr crime. And if you're old enough to pick up a gun, you're old enough to be tried as an adult. Yeah, thank you. Well, at least New, new, green, new Cambridge is on your side, so baby steps, baby steps. Um, I think one of the things that's really terrifying for me is that like the solution to decarcerate is now parole or probation. And this is where I think is at the heart of the problem is that our imaginations are so crippled by our desire to punish that we can't dream beyond the world that we see before us. And I have absolutely no doubt that in 100 years or, or maybe even sooner that society will look back at us in, in shame and disgust by the way that we have treated our most vulnerable population, in particular capital punishment. Um, in, in the same way that we might look back at um, you know, draconian times and in disgust, I, I have no doubt that the future will look back at us. Now we did have, again, very small baby steps with Nebraska uh, ending the death penalty, or eradicating the death penalty. And again, um, you know, two thirds, uh, we've had a decrease of the two thirds of the executions have gone down, and maybe you could talk about how this happened, and what does it mean for the future of the death penalty? Yeah. Well, it's an interesting moment. Um, you know, I don't want to say we're winning on death penalty abolition, but we're making great progress now. And I would like to say it's because you know, we've convinced the American public and policymakers about the morality issues, the ethical issues, and the like, and we've done that somewhat. But I think it's much more practical stuff there. Uh, speaks of why we're making progress. You know, one of it is uh, just the whole issue of innocence. You know, a month doesn't go by when you don't see a story in the front page of the papers that somebody spent 20, 30 years in prison on death row, and lo and behold, DNA evidence shows that <coughs> he wasn't, didn't commit the crime and all that. So even people who support the death penalty, I think many of them, you know, would rather not execute an innocent person. And so it gives pause to some of that. Um, it's also, I think there's some lack of uh, zeal now coming in from the system itself. You know, the death penalty cases are just horrendous from all sorts of reasons, but not the least of which is, you know, the amount of research.
resource on the law. You know, so from the time a person is convicted and sentenced to death, uh, it's not unusual that it takes 12, 15 years before they're executed. And that's the legal argument goes up and down the courts all over the country. The reversal rate is enormous. There's all sorts of problems with the trial. So, you know, if you're a prosecutor, um, you know, with any sort of concern, not just about justice, but about resources, too, you know, if this person is, you believe, is committed a murder, and you can charge and convict them, send them off to prison, um, it's a complicated case, but we're talking a few months, not a few decades or so. So I think there's some role in recognition of that. It would be nice if we could win on morality in the long run, uh, but I think that comes with abolishing the penalty. You know, there's interesting precedents in the, in the UK <clears throat> when they limited death penalty 40, 50 years ago. Public sentiment was not opposed to the death penalty, but for various reasons, political leadership decided the time had come to get rid of the death penalty. They did, and now <clears throat> in the UK and in all of Western Europe, there's no need whatsoever to bring back the death penalty. You know, people learn to live with it, and they say, this is what a civilized society should be doing. So I agree that it's a small step, right? And this isn't a way, but it's a step. And this is a way kind of going back to an earlier response. And some of the theme of the conversation has been, you know, how big of a deal is this change, right? Like how much optimism should we have about this particular small step or this particular new ally? Um, and I think Mark and I are both, you know, of two minds on that. And, it, you know, it depends on the issue on the day. I guess the one thing that I would say, and so part of me has always feels like, well, one reason the death penalty has gone down is that uh, the advent of life without parole as a sentencing option. Um, and that's been a very effective tool that's been used by the death penalty community. Um, it, but life without parole is unimaginably awful sentence and understood as such in most of in the rest of the world. Um, so, however, let me say this on a more kind of positive note. If you believe, as I do, that we got the system that we have because of a series of 1,000 or 10,000, you know, small steps, all pushing in the same direction, then it is true that every single one of, the way we're going to unwind this is with that same number of small steps in the opposite direction. And so we, I, you know, although I'm often frustrated, when you work in these systems and you're confronted every day with people whose lives have been so devastated and so damaged so needlessly by an overly punitive criminal justice system, then it is hard to you celebrate these small steps. But I do think that's how you're right about 100 years from now. And, it's, and it may, may or may not take 100 years, but the process is going to be a whole bunch of small steps along the way. Thank you. And maybe as we are sort of wrapping up and then hearing it towards the audience, you guys can um, use your super brains to tell us what some of those small steps could be practically for the everyday human doing. Well, uh, I'll start. I work on policy change primarily. Uh, I, I think the practitioner stuff is equally important. Uh, so you know, the main issue there are the sentencing policies, I think, that have really driven the mass incarceration. So it's mandatory sentencing, three strikes around, war on drugs. And uh, we, aside from just using the criminal justice system as a means of solving social problems, we use it much more punitively than comparable nations do. If you're sentenced to prison for burglary in the U.S., you're going to do more time than you would if you're sentenced in France or Italy or Canada and all across the board. So we're very extreme. Um, I'll give you one example, and there are many to do. This one is, is rather extreme, but it's real. So, Many of the mandatory penalties uh, were adopted in the federal justice system, although every state has its own variations, too. Mandatory penalties basically mean a judge can't take into account individual circumstances when you're convicted. So 
You may be a single mother and have two kids uh, who have been left behind if you're sentenced off to prison. The judge can't look at that. There may have been a history of physical or sexual abuse that may have contributed to your committing crime. The judge can't look at that, on and on. So one case uh, is a man named Weldon Angelos, uh, who's sitting in prison today, in federal prison. He was a 24-year-old music producer in Utah. He was also a sort of mid-level marijuana seller. On three separate occasions, he sold about $300 worth of marijuana to an undercover agent. On each of those three sales, he also was in possession of a weapon. One time he had a gun stuck in his socks, another time in his pocket. There was never any allegation that he used or threatened to use the weapon. So he's convicted based on uh, the undercover officer's testimony. So on the first of the three counts, um, he's sentenced to a mandatory five years in prison, given the quantity of marijuana that he sold, which is called the mandatory sentence. Now, on the second and the third charges, now he's being sentenced as essentially a repeat offender because he's got that first conviction, even though that first act happened only weeks before the second and the third act. So on the second and the third, he's punished now as a repeat drug offender, and a repeat drug offender is what they call a gun weapons enhancement. So you get extra time for having a weapon in the course of your drug selling. So he gets five years on the first count, 25 on the second, 25 on the third. So Welton Angelos is currently doing 55 years in federal prison for a marijuana sale, so about $1,000 when no one was injured. Uh, the sentencing judge at the time was a Republican, self-described conservative appointee to the federal bench. He was begging the defense attorney to give me something to work with so I don't have to impose this 55-year mandatory penalty. And of course, the defense attorney had nothing to give him because that's the whole idea behind mandatory penalties. Now, I don't want to suggest everyone in prison is in a circumstance like this, uh, but there are horror stories that we could tell you all night long about cases like this. So, uh, what I do, uh, what I think we need to do is a major piece is just say, to the extent we're going to use incarceration, we are just completely out of control in the degree to which we do it, and you should only use it when it's public safety. It requires that you keep the community safe, and we don't need to do that in 55 years. I think there's so many things that individuals can do, and, and I'll speak to a few that are mostly outside of the legal system. Um, because sometimes when people ask me, you know, and, and I was e recently at a panel and a woman said, well, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so I, what can I do? Now, it turned out that she was in business school. So that links up to a first set of things that people can do, which is one of the biggest obstacles that folks have um, is once you have a criminal record, a conviction, how hard it is to get hired. And so if you own a business or if you work in a business, then you ask your employer what the policy is about hiring people that have criminal records. And there's a big ban the box campaign and there's a whole series of initiatives that are out there that people can look to as models. If you're at a university, if you're a university student, you've got to ask the question, What's my does my university require people as part of the initial application, there's a big movement going on right here in New York State on this issue, um, to change how universities ask people about their criminal records because the research shows that if you have that as the init, an initial question and the initial application, most people don't ever even fill out the application because if you have a criminal record, you assume when you see that that it's never going to get read. That's not an unreasonable assumption, by the way, for people to make. And so as a result, there's a movement to say and NYU has just announced this, but there's a big movement that'll have a bigger impact in the state system of New York to say that you can't ask about whether the person has a criminal record until after the decision has been made about admission. Of course, schools, just like employers, have to do these inquiries, but it turns out it matters quite a lot. Once you've hired somebody, made an initial hiring decision, or made an offer of admission to somebody, then, the employer or the university actually investigates the background and finds out, is this the sort of thing that I actually can't hire this person? 
or is this just a box that I was using to exclude somebody? So that's one. Another thing is to serve on juries. I cannot tell you, as a public defender, how often I would be in court and a juror would start talking and it would be some version of, the judge would say, well, has anybody had any experience with the criminal justice system? Yeah, my cousin was arrested. Do you think that that will allow, do you think you could continue to serve as a juror? Or would that make you unfair? And so many people said, oh no, I wouldn't be able, I don't think I would be able to be fair. And those people were just put off the jury. Now, I'm not saying everyone's got to tell the truth when you're asking, when you're in jury service. But we do have this problem, which is that, and you see it in the death penalty as well, which is that people that actually have some understanding of how the criminal justice system plays out, that have been there and seen how police can misbehave, who are aware of circumstances where evidence ended up where really nobody understands how it got there, those people take themselves out of the jury pool. So don't do that. Be fair, listen to the evidence. If the person's guilty, they're guilty. If they're innocent, they're innocent. But don't take yourself out of the process before the process even begins. That's something that it, not, not everybody in the room, but many, many people in the room would be able to do, would be able to, would be able to serve on juries. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is for folks that are educators or no educators, the school to prison pipeline and the school discipline systems, there's a big movement in New York. If you need to know, about, know more about it, my stepfather here, Terry Weber, he can raise his hand, to come talk to him afterwards. There's a lot of activists on the ground that are trying to bring a more restorative, more rehabilitative, more child-centered, more humane system of creating a positive school climate, having fair discipline, having fewer police officers in schools. And there's a lot of people that can get involved in that. You can get involved in that if you know, if you know educators, you can get involved in that as mentors and as tutors. It's a, let me, can I just tell you one case that I recently had in my clinic Quickly. Possession of marijuana. <laughs> the school system was asking for the young man to be expelled for possession of the amount of marijuana that one person could use on one day to get high, expelled for 100 days. Now, I teach at Yale University. And let me just tell you that if everybody who <laughs> used marijuana at Yale University got kicked out for 100 days, I would not have a job at Yale University. Would, we would have no students, or very few. This is the kind of thing that individuals in this room can make a difference in change. Thank you both very much. And I will just add to that, answering my own question, please excuse me. But I think if we can, as individuals, begin to challenge and question our own complicity and addiction to punishment, um, and the way we respond to being wronged, either in our personal situations or in our more global or social situations, um, we can really begin to shift things. And one of the ways is like whether or not our first response to having capital or <clears throat> items, physical items being stolen is to call 911. If you recognize that each time you call 911, you, you have the potential of perhaps wrongfully putting someone into the system for life. And that's terrifying. Um, and I think we can sum up the questions we have here and open it up for about 10 minutes to the audience. Does anybody have questions? And Josh will run around. You can start here, Josh. As you read the Times the last few days, uh, happily, uh, Preet has been issuing subpoenas for uh, Norman Seabrook and the whole what's happening in the Department of Corrections. Is this a national problem of protecting corrections officers and making <coughs> the incarceration so much more inhumane, or is this a uniquely a unique problem we have in New York? And what can we do to help correct that? Well, I'm glad you asked about uh, the uh, corrections officials um, and corrections unions. 
because I think that we are really, this is a time when we really need some visionary, progressive leadership from within police departments and from within <coughs> corrections uh, departments, from union leaders who want to say, this way that we've been doing business, where we protect everybody, is not good for anybody. It's not good for the folks that are being abused when they are being abused. It's not good for the officers that are trying to do the right thing and to do a good job. Because they're getting, I don't want to work in an environment where the person next to me is violating their oath and not being punished. I do not want to work in that environment. And, but, unfortunately, uh, and from what I know, I don't know Norman Seabrooks, I only know the press accounts, but from what I have read, he is the opposite of what I'm describing when I talk about progressive visionary. Um, he has been a, a major and consistent obstacle uh, for reform. And I don't know the details of you know what they're do you know with this investigation, but I think to answer your question, I think that it's a national problem, and I do think that it's something that has so far been behind the scenes. We have much more focus on policing because we see it, and there's much less attention on what's going on inside our prisons and our jails because it is so hidden. And so I'm really glad you asked that question. I've been working in this field for about 45 years, and I really can enjoy uh, some of you guys' comments. But I want to sort of emphasize something that I think you sort of missed a little bit. One is the uh, Koch brothers. Now, you know, I, I'm not on there, you know, they were always monsters about the Koch brothers. But when I started to see that they themselves and the Koch industries are not taking turn of the series, they're just in the recently, and they're going to put their weight and power behind criminal justice reform. But they're not the local townspeople making money on this. There's something going very deep here, and almost a perfect storm in the reverse of the crack cocaine, but it's just about easy to read first base, so that would be one thing. The second thing I would suggest is what uh, you were saying about uh, people uh, who have uh, money, they're not getting the same consequences as those that don't, and you're not saying that they sh should or should be nicer to the rest. I don't agree with that. Okay. And here's why. To get change, you gotta have experience. We know in drug treatment, when a judge's kid gets into trouble, that judge who is really very tough and difficult now is supporting drug treatment. If that, if the consequences are more across the board, a lot of people, a lot of middle class people and the rest, we start rising up and then become a part of this movement of change. Yeah, I will say, I often jokingly say, uh, We'll have more reform when we send more politicians to prison because nine out of ten of them come out as prison reform is all the time. Uh, just for the record, people should only go to prison if necessary and if they've committed a crime. I'm just talking about the experience. And over the last 20 years, many politicians have gone to prison and uh, they're very active in the reform movement. We have a question right here, and then maybe this gentleman over here. I had a question about the intro and the sentencing. We mentioned that one of the biggest problems is that with the tie in the hands of judges, it seems in many ways it's then passed that power in the hands of prosecutors, but have a lot of leeway in terms of what charges to press because so many people plead instead of going to trial. Do you think that it's possible to fix the mass incarceration system without reducing the vast percentage of people who take plea deals and without increasing the percentage of people who actually end up going to trial and getting a case? Well, I think it's parts of the question, but in, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Mandatory sentencing makes the prosecutors even more powerful than they ordinarily would be because now the charge and the plea negotiation is all in their hands. And what it also does, you know, it's a, um, it's a, it's a power struggle between prosecution and defense and the weight of the evidence and criminal history, all that sort of thing. But when you have mandatory sentencing that you're holding over the head, 
uh, of uh, the defendant, uh, it inevitably will mean that the plea negotiations are tilted much more direction of prosecution in a much more punitive way. Uh, this very good piece has not been in the Times the last couple of days. Norman Lynch, uh, an academic who studies the issues, talking about how this works out in the federal system. You know, those power dynamics have always been there. The prosecutors have always had a lot of power, but it's magnified tremendously now in the era of mandatory sentencing, three strikes, you know, all that kind of stuff. Do you want to add anything? No, except maybe become a prosecutor, I tell some of my students. I mean, I know this is controversial, um, but I do, and Paul Butler has spoken eloquently about why it doesn't make sense for progressive people to become prosecutors. <coughs> And he makes a compelling argument. But I, the one thing that I would say is I do think this goes back to the moment, the mo political moment that we're in. So I do think that today, and it's different from the crack cocaine years, I think there's an opportunity now, both in police departments and in prosecutors' offices, for progressive people that want to infuse humane values uh, in those places to do it. And so, both at the police level and at the prosecutor, prosecutor level, I think, with, I'm like 51-49 on this, but I, <laughs> but I think people should do it, because I think it could make a difference. Um, could, you, could you talk about the idea of uh, getting rid of bail, because it really, really affects poor people, and how you think that might affect the uh, plea bargaining? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's so complicated because some New York is a place that where with a bail system and you end up with a lot of poor people who get held because they can't make bail. There are other jurisdictions that have gotten rid of bail, but the problem is they've replaced the bail with another form of preventive detention, which ends up leading to the same kind of so we need, I guess I would say, whatever, what we need to do, I think, is get rid of bail, move to this preventive detention style system, but dramatically reduce the number of offenses where we presume that you should be able to be locked up pre-trial. To get to your question about the effect, I think it will have a, have a dramatic effect. I mean, when, once it, like my client, that I told you about earlier, who's the heroin addict. If she had been locked up, she might have been more likely to take that plea and never been able to walk out of that courthouse. The fact that she was out changed the balance of power somewhat. Prosecution still has the most power. But if you're walking around, it's a different kind of decision that you get to make as an individual than if you're locked up. Um, I just got the cue that we have time for one more question if someone has a burning question. Imani, in the back. It's actually not a question, so maybe it'll give someone else space for an actual question. I just want to read uh, the 13th Amendment because for me, um, I had actually never really read it before and it was kind of illuminating as to the situation of prisons here in the U.S. Uh, the 13th Amendment, we all know, abolished slavery, allegedly. Uh, it says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Uh, so to just sort of uh, clarify and reiterate, uh, slavery and involuntary servitude are constitutionally legal within institutions of pro crime and punishment. So I think once we uh, understand prisons in this context, that it's actually the continuation of uh, old school slavery. Uh, and you think of slavery as a fundamentally economic institution. We really see what's going on here. You know, we can't deny uh, that prisons are for-profit systems. Uh, prisons are increasingly being privatized. And just one last thing, that if everyone uh, actually goes to nasdaq.com uh, and searches for CCA slash CSW, the Correctional Corporation of America, you can see all of the banks and retirement funds, investment funds, asset management funds that you all probably have money invested in that are profiting from incarcerated persons. There are teachers' retirement funds from most states in this country that are investing their money 
in this system. So this is a really great way to get started. You're all shareholders, most likely, so you all have some power. And if we start to organize people around this issue, you know, we can either start to divest our money or demand from these companies that they change their investment practices. Thank you very much. I don't think I can uh, imagine a better way to wrap this up. So thank you very much to the panelists, James and Andrew.